So this year we had a, a many rare, very exciting uh, submissions, and I hope we will greatly enjoy reading them, and I hope we will just enjoy this. Before we begin, I want to say a few words about the workshop. So this year we conducted a workshop for a very tight cooperation with our Hamel workshop. And you will see today and tomorrow that these three workshops uh, really have different focuses and different audiences. And we, Jacques and I, took a liberty to uh, move a few papers around with those concepts so that the match the audience. So now the workshops is kind of seem to be a more theoretical part of the program. And indeed, we have a few theoretical sessions like the one that follows in the but we also have an implementation session, for example, about the SML Sharp and the uh, OS. And we have many papers about uh, how to best take best advantage of features of ML for designing, for example, libraries, for and maybe function interfaces. And we also have uh, papers about, or we also have discussions about features that ML, standard ML currently doesn't have, but probably should have. And those features have been tried in other languages, like Rust and Scala. Although Scala and Rust they are not members of ML, they are not related to ML by blood, but they are all also higher order strict, uh, with type to end, with a type to inform And I hope that this tradition of including all members of extended ML family will continue. So we can uh, the, by, uh, continue the tradition of ML workshop to be informal workshop. So this is not a place to present uh, journal like papers in place. So we have we aim to present uh, set, uh, present uh, the presentations should be or we aim to have a presentation of maybe not fully finished result but should be exciting, interesting, or maybe there are some cautious sale or something that doesn't work out. And of course that doesn't say that details do not matter, simply there are different ways uh, different ways of presenting details. And therefore we aim to after the workshop we aim to publish the proceedings and the uh, EPTC as electronic proceedings of the radical computer science, which is very reputable value, very highly prestigious, and all uh, make the proceedings available online for free. And so the after workshop is selected with the papers and present them, and those papers are supposed to be journal like quality and could be reviewed as such. Well, but this is all in the future, and then for the present, I'll pass over to the future of the session. <coughs> to rethink ML, the design of ML, in a nicer and uh, cleaner way. So, okay, let's see what it seems. Okay, to do. So, we speak of ML as the language, right? Or maybe in this room as the language. Um, but, <laughs> But uh, as you're probably all aware, when you use it, uh, when you look at it, it's actually not one language. It's uh, at least two languages. So there's like the core language where you have functions, you have records, and you have all kinds of other things. And there's the module level, which also has like structures, it has functions, and they're like mostly the same thing, but with completely different syntax and of course lots of subtle differences. And if you want, there's even a, a third language hiding in there, which is the language of type expressions, where you also have these things like application, tuples, and stuff like that. Um, and of course, yeah, they are all syntactically completely different for no good reason whatsoever. So like, let me, let me ask you uh, in this room, who likes the type application syntax of an app? <laughs> OK, I thought so. <laughs> right, and so you have all this duplication, and this duplication also leads to the fact that you always have several ways to do things, right? So especially with parameterization, you can always do it in the core language, or you can use the module language, write a function for that. And often it's not actually easy to make the right choice, and part of the reason is that modules in ML are also second class. So um, they form this, this separate language layer, and they're different trade-offs between choosing modules and choosing core constructs. So modules have the more fancy types, um, 
but uh, they are also more verbose, heavyweight, and cannot do any anything computationally interesting. And the core has the convenience of type inference and all these other constructs, and it's more lightweight. So it's not an easy trade-off to do. And the, the core thing, of course, is that modules here. They are second class, which means they can't be computed, right? You cannot compute over modules um, or use them, pass them around as data. And this, of course, has been observed as a limitation in the past uh, long ago. There has been a long line of work uh, for proposing different variations of what I call your packaged modules, which allow you to package up a module as a first class value and pass it around. So starting from Claudio Russo's work in 1909 and its implementation in Moscow and Alabama, a lot of other papers uh, show how you can do that. But let me stretch here that this is not what I mean with first class modules. Um, it's not what I want. What I really want is a classless society, right? Revolution. Um, <laughs> so there shouldn't be any first class, second class distinction at all. And the reason, the motivation is sure, I want the expressive power of first class modules. Um, but I want it with style, right? I don't want all this incoherence, duplication, and verbosity anymore. Um, and of course, I also want all that without losing anything. <coughs> so, my proposal is what I call 1ML, and the name is actually a triple pun, so you can read it either as like a, first, a unified ML, or you can read it as first class module language. Um, <laughs> And it's also a pun on a questionable idea from my perspective that's going on in the JavaScript community. Um, so there have been lots of, when you look at the literature and programming languages, there have been lots of attempts and uh, designs where languages were extended with some module-like construct. And usually the way this works is that people have some language and then they want some module-like functionality, so they come up with some constructs they add to this language. And this almost inevitably makes you run into all sorts of limitations with expressiveness and you need ad hoc restrictions. It never really works out all that well. So that's not what I want to do here. I want to take a different approach and do the opposite. I actually start with a well-defined, clean <coughs> language and just add core constructs to it and see where that leads us. Um, of course, there are some challenges, challenges on the way, um, but I want, if possible, to address them with the most possible minimal restrictions. So, to make things a bit simpler, let me start with an explicitly typed version of one and all. So, here's like a core syntax. Um, let me see if the pointer works. Take it out. <coughs> no, I already told you. But. Okay, so first line there um, is basically the core of animal modules, as you know it. So you have structures, you have functors, and you have the ceiling operator. On the type level, uh, similarly, right? And one thing to note here is that you have two kinds of functors, so if you remember my talk from two years ago, this is exactly that. You have both pure and impure functors, so a generative and applicative functor, both total and partial and everything. Um, and to that, I just add, like, as a representative of a core language construct, Booleans, as one example. And that's interesting because that actually introduces a branching construct. So you can now do something computationally interesting. Um, but there's another thing I also want to change here, and that is instead of having types as some declaration form that you have to write in structures, I really want to turn them into modules. That is, I replace the syntax for type declarations and specifications with syntax for modules and types that carry types. So this type T thing up there, you can think of it as an anonymous module that just encapsulates a type. So you can use this type as a value if you want. And the type type below them is uh, the type of that thing. It can be a type of that thing. And there's also the other thing, this equals e, which uh, is what you usually call a single type, so uh, which gives you transparent types. So let me explain that with an example. So 
what I want to do is the, the upper line is what you would usually write in conventional ML, right? You know, so you have the structure of the lab that contains those items and you can assign the signature to it, which means it's a constraint. And I want to treat that as just sugar for something that has a <laughs> module T, and that module happens to be such an anonymous T. And then you can also have the anonymous type directly. And this idea is actually not, not new. I mean, if you're familiar with more recent module literature, then this is what something that a lot of that those does, uh, that does in, in its internal <coughs> So you can think of it as just a syntactic cleanup. It's a kind of simplification. And it also has to extend to um, transparent type specifications, and that's where these single types come in. So instead of having a transparent declaration, assign it type which says it's equal to a certain other type. Right. Um, and this extends to type constructors. So as you may have noticed, I know the language I showed you didn't have any notion of type constructor, and there was no accident because I actually want to encode them as functors. So this type constructor declaration you see there, I want to interpret it as syntactic sugar for this functor. So it's just a functor that takes a single module, which is a type, and it returns a type. And similarly, on the type level, then, if you make this a, if you specify this type abstractly, then what you're actually specifying is a functor. And at this point, it's important that this is actually an applicative functor. So the double arrow on the type level stands for an applicative functor. Because you want to guarantee that when you apply it twice to the same type, you get out the same type, but right? these should be compatible. If this was a, gen a generative functor, of course, that wouldn't make any sense. Okay, to just demonstrate how this plays together, the unavoidable example, kind of standard example you always see with moyas and functors, some and functor. Um, and the syntax should look very familiar now, right? Uh, only minor stylistic changes. Maybe one interesting thing to look at is uh, here I extend or generalize this syntax <coughs> that we use for type constructors to they are just modules so we can have the same syntax for everything where uh, the variable <coughs> on the left hand side is basically interpreted as an argument of type type. Right? So this is really uh, just an abbreviation for this functor type. And similarly here, uh, and of course this arrow is just abbreviation for omitting the name. And here uh, you see how I mix uh, generative and applicative. So the kind of polymorphism here is a, an applicative abstraction, whereas the real operational part is potentially an impure function, functor, or I never really know which word to use. And then. Uh, in the implementation, there's nothing really surprising, um, but yeah, it's all explicitly typed. <coughs> um, but you probably want to see more interesting examples uh, of things you couldn't do with ML before. And the standard example about first class modules is the ability to select uh, something at one time, right? So this is kind of the textbook example. You have some data set which you need to store in the map, and you want to pick the most efficient one, the most efficient implementation. And in 1ML, you can just write it like this. Um, so, of course, this is nothing you couldn't have done before with packaged modules, um, for example, in OCaml, but it would have been much more tedious or verbose. So, for example, in OCaml, you would have to write it like this. And I would argue you don't want that, you want to write that. Um, more interesting example, maybe. So if you're familiar with Haskell, then uh, this might look somewhat familiar. You can think of this signature defined there as the type class. So this is a collection <coughs> class, and it comes with a couple of operations and also with two so-called associated types. So it, when you know what C is, you have an instance for it, uh, for the parameter type C, then you're supposed to know the key and the value type. And then you can write a function like this, which just takes an instance, so here it's explicit, of course, um, and you can just project the key and the value type of the thing. So again, that is something you can also approximately express already with uh, package modules, but it's a bit more verbose. So in 
can when you basically have to encode it like this. So you have to manually pull out all the, the types in there into separate polymorphic type arguments and then declare all the type sharing. And that works to some degree, but you can imagine that it doesn't really scale all that well. You basically have to do face splitting manually. Um, here's another example of something that doesn't work anymore in your panel. Uh, same kind of thing, you have some type class kind of thing, but it's actually a constructor class, so it's higher kind. And in this case, the function we write here has to express some type sharing between like the type class instance arguments of the type M and the result type of this function. They share the type M. And this type is higher kind, and so you can't factor it out using ML polymorphism. OK, so I guess these examples were kind of obvious or boring to the people in the audience who already know a lot of about, about modules. So for those uh, module nerds here, let me drop a few technicalities about what is going on in the knees. So I said we we take a module language and, and build on top of that. And the one I'm choosing here is maybe not surprisingly our effing module semantics. Uh, um, so we we take the rules and the semantics from our, from our effing modules paper, including all this implicit quantifier shuffling it does, uh, which I won't really show you at all. Um, we take that unchanged, more or less, and we just collapse the two syntactic levels, and that also implies that we collapse the two semantic type levels of the internal <coughs> language. And as it turns out, you can leave almost most of the rules unchanged. So in a way, effing modules already is a first-class module language, with just some tiny tweaks. So there are some challenges. Um, one is decidability that always comes up with first-class modules, right? Um, Phase separation might be an issue, so you don't want to need to introduce real dependent types to express all that. And of course, type inference. And one thing that might be a problem but actually isn't one is the so-called avoidance problem, which deals with uh, local abstract types and how you scope them and so on and so forth. And one benefit of starting from an actual module language that solves all that is that that just extends to the new constructs you introduce. So it's not a problem. So, but decidability. Um, it is well known that uh, the presence of abstract signatures, so the ability to make a signature abstract, a signature that itself contains abstract types, can lead to undecidability. So that, for example, occurred in Arthur Lilliewicz's translucent sum calculus, which was a first class module calculus, but you can also see it in OCaml on the module level, because OCaml actually has abstract signatures. And I could show you an example, but it would take probably five to 10 minutes to parse, so I won't do that uh, just very abstractly. The reason is that if you allow such kind of matching, then this can lead to an infinite sequence of substitutions you have to perform in your subtyping network. Um, and it has to do with contravariance of functors. So another problem is actually if we allow that, we're breaking one of the elaboration semantic uh, uh, invariants of the effing semantics. Um, because we always have to know which quantifiers are lying around, and this will break. So, what do we do? Well, the obvious answer is, don't do it. Um, we just apply this well-known idea from, like, especially dependently typed languages. This comes up. We just disallow substituting a, an abstract type as a type. Right. So, while the type rule can be classified as type, the type type cannot. That's predicativity is. And <coughs> even in the context of modules, this is not a new idea. It already comes up in like the papers from the 80s by Harper Mitchell on their full XML calculus, which was like type theory to explain modules. And basically you just uh, separate the, the type into the types into universes. The upper one, the large one, contains all types, and the small types are just monotypes. So they closely correspond to what you would have as core types in classic ML. And yeah, the key restriction is that only small types have type type. And the second key restriction then that we apply here is that when you do signature matching, you only allow small types to match abstract. 
and then you're basically done. That's the only restriction you really need. Um, and that, from my perspective, is actually what the whole uh, syntactic stratification in ML with ML modules boils down to. It's a very blunt way to enforce predicativity. And here we do it in a more surgical way, just on the simplified type. Uh, we'll just flash by this slide by you. Um, so if you're familiar with the FA modules paper, then this is how the, the internal types change. So we now have this large and small types, and the only place where it comes up is when you have an abstract type now, which can now occur on the signature level, then the arguments to that can only be small types. Uh -huh. The rest of it doesn't really change. Do the alphas there range over large or small types? They themselves can again only be uh, substituted with small types. Yes. Modulo down the abstraction. But when you have applicative functor, it can be a, it's basically a general a lambda, a type lambda whose body is a small type. Um, right. So another topic uh, is phase separation. I'm going to skip that here in, in the interest of time. Let me just mark that it's not a problem. Um, and let, let's get to type inference. So, of course, that's also something we want to have. And, of course, uh, you can imagine that, in general, you can't just infer types anymore for anything. Right? So you definitely won't have a complete type inference mechanism. But you can have some of it. And the key idea here is that if we just reuse the distinction we introduced with small and large types, and we say we just infer small types. So I extend the language, the type language, with little bit of syntax. One is the type wildcard, and that just stands for a type that is to be suppo supposed to be inferred by the compiler, and this is always a small type. And then we just allow dropping type annotations that are just this wildcard, and then you can write functions, for example, in the style you're used to in ML. Um, and the other thing is basically a variation of a pure functor, I call it an implicit function, um, and that's basically to recover ML style polymorphism. So, functors of this type of functions um, are always implicitly introduced and implicitly uh, eliminated, very much in the Hindler Milner style, basically. So, the place where we introduce them is when you bind a structure field and you eliminate them somewhat differently from ML, uh, not for every variable, but whenever you, it occurs in an elimination form, in another. And you can also eliminate it or introduce it by subtype. Um, and I picked a tick here to mark Im uh, implicit functions. And the reason for that, you can see here, if we now slightly extend our syntactic sugar that we had before, then this is like uh, almost resembling <laughs> the syntax we're used to from ML, right? So you now have an implicit argument A there. And yeah, in the implementation, this is really now like you would want to write it. No type annotations anymore. They all implicitly underbar. Um, so how does this <coughs> work here? So the main observation is that when you look at the subtyping rules um, and you specialize them to small types, then they almost degenerate to type equivalents. Because most of the things they are concerned with is what we do with quantifiers. How do you substitute and all that? And just, that just completely vanishes when you just look at small types. There is one exception, of course, uh, which we'll come back to in a minute. But that means that you can basically incorporate all the unification logic into your subtyping algorithm. It's a bit more complicated than before, but it works. And of course, I was lying. So there's one thing uh, that uh, subtyping does that is not just equivalence and that is with subtyping. Um, and so here, if you're just doing it like that, then you will be incomplete. For that. So one solution, of course, would be row variables, and then you could do real inference even for that. Um, but there are some other sources of incompleteness. One is the include construct, which gives you kind of record concatenation if you want. So row variables, a more complicated form of row variables might also help here, but it's a bit more tricky. Um, and then there's a more obscure, uh, corner of the language which has to do with principality in presence of the value restriction and functors, which I won't explain here, but you hit that here too. 
Um, but the point I want to make really is that none of these problems are actually new to 1ML. They all already exist in a language like standard ML. So for example, when you use structural record types in ML, in standard ML, then you have to do, put in type annotations in general. It's not actually a principle. Um, include, okay, include you can't even express, but the value restriction also just occurred. Uh, the, the third problem with the value restriction is the very same in, in existing amounts. So in terms of practical uh, completeness or incompleteness, you haven't actually lost anything is my claim. Um, so to sum up, uh, the main observation this work was based on is that when you look at the effing module semantics, then it almost already describes the first class module language. Um, and you can walk this last step pretty easily. The, the key you have to do is to introduce this uh, predicativity restriction. And from my perspective, that really isolates the essence of the whole stratification that is going on with modules in ML. Um, and inference, uh, so I haven't fully worked out all the details with inference yet, but I think it's quite possible and, and natural and pretty robust if you just apply the restriction to small types. And my conjecture is that while it is incomplete, it is no more so than in in some sense uh, than an existing ML like standard. Okay, so obviously there are lots of future directions. So one thing I would like to do is uh, make applicative uh, functors more general. So I didn't really go into that here, but the semantics of applicative functors in the language I showed you is rather limited. So it's basically equivalent to the semantics from Shao's 99 paper where you can only introduce an applicative functor by sealing at a higher order functor type a completely transparent functor. So that is quite limited, but it's, in, it's everything I needed to get type constructors to work and sealing over type constructors. And you, you could generalize that. It's not that difficult in the explicitly typed language, but type inference is a bit harder than. Um, another kind of popular idea these days is that I'm introducing these implicit functors here, but uh, I should have mentioned that, of course, yeah, you saw that from the syntax already. Currently, the, their domain is always just type, right? And you could imagine generalizing that to allow more things and then recovers type classes to some extent, but of course, that comes with all sorts of implications that are not obvious. I already mentioned row polymorphism, so that's definitely something I want to look into if that makes things nicer. And of course, you have this richer language now, and type inference is relatively limited to this core language. And can we apply all this uh, rich literature on doing more inference for first class polymorphism or fragments of that or higher end polymorphism to make a larger subset of the language infer? Recursive modules is definitely an interesting problem here. So I have kind of this feeling if I was to take this approach and combine it with mix ML, I might get something like Scala, just much cleaner. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, and of course, implementation. So I have a prototype interpre interpreter where you can try out some things, um, but it's not in the state right now that I want to give it out to people, but if you're interested, I, I can show it to you. And that's all I have to share. So one thing I also didn't mention is that, of course, you can have a predicative abstraction, but you have to be explicit about it. So the language has a construct that allows you to wrap up uh, some, some uh, small, some large type into, and inject it into the small numbers, and then you can it, it basically looks like the pack construct for first class modules, but you have to use it in far fewer cases. Thank you.
Sure, definitely. Do you have ideas of what the other can that you want to do? Not really, no. I mean, uh, I guess my main concern always is that you want to keep it understandable and robust. And this, this small type restriction here is at least very easy to understand and to implement. So, but yeah, it would definitely be interesting. <coughs> and conversely, maybe there is a better. So here, but now we need some system that time. Down to 
some machine code or something, mm -hmm. then you will encounter tons of problems. Sure, sure. And so, <laughs> and I, that, I, that requires some kind of technical development and also separation of data centers. I completely agree, but I would argue that this is, these problems are mostly orthogonal to what I showed, and basically this change in the language doesn't change anything about these problems either way. Okay, thanks again.